Okay, Jordy. Uh, I guess we're going to have this presentation, you know, on uh, the first isomorphism theorem, you know, I whatever so. that means at this point. I guess so, yeah. You know, something that comes up usually in your first course in linear algebra or possibly your first course in abstract algebra, modern algebra, whatever your, you know, whatever it ends up being called uh, for you. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, to get things started, you know, before we kind of get all the way over to this first isomorphism thing, I've, I heard about your dilemma with your, uh, your gift to your brother, Jose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, you know, I found this very nice function in Walmart and I bought it for my bro bro brother's birthday. His name is Jose, by the way. Uh, the problem though, is I is that after some time I figured out that he actually likes bijective functions and this function uh, is not bijective. So I am sad, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, what are we gonna do about this, right? Well, you know, it's kind of like buying a cake for him. You know, maybe he didn't want cherries or strawberries or something on top of it, uh -huh. uh, but he wanted candles instead. You know, what are we gonna do about this, right? Well, if there's something on top he doesn't want, just take it off. And, um, you know, maybe we already have, you know, it's too late to go back to the story. I'm not sending you back to Walmart. I'm not buying another function. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you're not going to go buy extras. Maybe you already have some things lying around, you know. I, I tell you what. Let's maybe cut this thing up. I don't want to say let's glue a piece of the cake, you know, but uh, let's do something about this to give him a bijection. Okay. Something natural. Yeah. So, well, you know, first of all, if we want a bijection, we're going to want, we're going to want a bijective, or uh, I mean, if we want a bijective function, right, we're going to first of all want a surjection and an injection. True. Um, let's, you know what, screw it. Let's, let's make sure that this thing is a surjection first. Okay. Uh, how can we do that? Well, <laughs> it's pretty clear that we're not hitting this element D here. So I don't see any reason to keep it. You know, let's just kind of get rid of it. You know, it won't be the set B anymore, but in this case, we're only taking our outputs now, right? So let's replace B with the image of G. Okay, so that means you want to kill D, right? Uh, I, I didn't say kill. Uh, well, let's let's remove, let's snip it out of here, right? Okay. So that means we're considering now the image of G instead of just uh, B. We know that's a subset of B. Though. Absolutely. Um, okay, great. This looks like a promising start. However, uh, we're definitely going to need injectivity. Um, any ideas on how we can kind of force this into being an injection? Well, you see, there's an issue here. Take, for example, the element C in our code. Okay, notice how one, three, and seven both go, uh, all three go to C. And for us to receive an injection, we will like only one element to go to C. I see. We have we have a three to one situation here on, on, on this particular element, right? Right. Like of course we have one to one is you know with five going to A. I mean, there's nothing else going to A. And it looks like only one thing is going to E, so that's cool. Yep. Uh, but we definitely have an issue with A and uh, or not A, uh, B and C. So what do we do about this, right? Yeah. Well, suppose we could lump things together. Yeah, yeah, of course. We're going to modify this thing, right? You know, let's, uh, you know, let's take this thing apart a little bit. This, uh, this step A. Let's, maybe, maybe, you know, I got a better idea. Let's not use A itself. Let's fix A a tiny bit. Okay. So you see how one, three, and seven all go to C? Uh huh. It would be pretty darn cash money if one, three, and seven were just lumped into one thing, right? Because then right. instead of having three different arrows going to C, mm -hmm. if we lump those three things together and pretend like it's one element, now we have exactly one arrow going to C. Yes. Uh huh. And that fixes the issue at C. Mm -hmm. um, we do still, of course, have this issue at B, but you know. We're smart enough to do the same thing elsewhere, right? I mean, it seems to fix it. So let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, in this case, we'd have to lump together uh, what, like two and five. We'd have to lump one, three, and seven into their own clump. And 
It looks like two and four are good to go. Okay. Uh, so let's see what happens actually when you um, when we do this. There we go. Well, that looks like a good old fashioned bijective function. I think Jose, I mean, he might not love it, but whatever, you know, this is at least what he wanted. Hey, we did all we could, right? <laughs> and I didn't want to get another function for moment. Absolutely. This. This looks like an HEB kind of one or uh, kind of function now, you know? Um, anyway, uh, what is this new set though? This doesn't appear to be A anymore. Yeah, it seems that we're collecting, as we said, uh, one, three, and seven are all going to one element, right? So we're treating one, three, and seven as just an element itself, same as two and six. So what's going on here? I see, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's kind of like taking a cake. Right. We're not exactly um, like, you know, if we, we can break a, you know, break a cake down into really, really tiny pieces, right? Mm -hmm. But we're not trying to go for atoms here. You know, we're not trying to break <laughs> this, you know, down the light, you know, to such a small, fine level. We're just cutting a few pieces. Really. I mean, some pieces are obviously larger than all this. I mean, at least in some sense, but, but we're just, we're just cutting this thing apart, right, into subsets. But, you know, we're really cutting these into partitions, right? None of, none of these pieces of cake overlap. Right. Yeah. Right, like, like this point one here, uh, one only belongs to that top piece of the cake. It doesn't belong to any of these other three. And really, there's no overlap with the others. And on top of that, if we put all of these pieces back together, we still have our original, um, we still have our original set. Right. Everyone's got an individual piece of cake. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I don't see any reason as to why Jose wouldn't be happy with that. Um, so this this uh, new set A, you know, forward slash tilde, what is this? Yeah, well, the tilde is usually, we usually talk about it when we, when we use equivalence relations. I see, I see. Just like, uh, you know, like our transitivity and reflexivity and symmetry, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. And these, uh, these equivalence relations give us this, um, give us these partitions. Right. I see. These are one and the same. Mm -hmm. We're just taking our set as a cake and we're kind of cutting it up into pieces, that, which don't overlap, mm -hmm. but which still form the right? I see. So this is pretty cool. So uh, we have this, so we have this new function, right? This like induced function here. And we've now induced a bijection. Yes, so let's give it a name for to this function. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's call that G hat. Exactly. Perfectly fine. You know, you bought G from Walmart and well, it wasn't exactly to his taste or liking. So let's just give him G hat instead. Yeah. Now I'm sure he'll be happy. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't even need to go back to Walmart, you know, to get this. So, so that's cool. Um, anyway, though, we talked about the first isomorphism theorem at the beginning. We um, did. Uh, but for that sort of thing, we need to make sure that we have like morphism types and sort of like, say, like a group homomorphism, ring homomorphism, or like a linear transformation of vector spaces or something like that. Yeah. Um, so let's say, um, we'll talk about morphisms. Groups or rings. If you're more familiar with vector spaces, you can also do that. Yeah, and, and you know, morphisms on vector spaces, right? Like, like a linear transformation over, like, say, the real numbers or the complex numbers, the rationals, whatever your field of interest is. Exactly. So, say for example, if we have a um, um, group homomorphism, let's say B goes from group D to a group H. How can we bring this analogy um, to this context? Well, what did we have, right? Uh, how, did, how, did we, uh, how did we lump our elements together? Well, if we go back to our, uh, to our previous example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if we go up to it, uh, what did we do? Like, well, we saw all of the elements going to C. Like we kind of fixed this point C. Right. This was obviously a problem point. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, what did we do? We just took all of the points that went there and just kind of said they're one element, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, what if this set G is, uh, you know, the underlying set for G, um, it's not 
technically I said it's a group, but <clears throat> what if we, you know, this thing could be huge. Sure. This could be very much. So instead of take, you know, drawing off, you know, doing what we did before, let's just take two points. There could only be one, whatever. You know, it could look different, be the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I put on a hat, I'm still me. <laughs> <Where's that? laughs> um, anyway, though, if we take two points out of G, let's say A and B, okay. and let's suppose they go to the same place. Okay. Uh, what does that mean, right? Uh, with, with respect to our partition or our equivalence relation? Suppose G of A is G of B. Yeah, well, th this, is, this was precisely our equivalence relation before, right? So if we want to use our tilde that we had before, this just means if and only if, um, you know, A is uh, related to B. I see, okay. Um, but if we have that, um, oh, but right, you said we're talking about groups or mm -hmm. like a ring or a vector space or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know what, let's, let's keep going with groups, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do a linear transformation on the side, uh, we can do that as well. Like, on T from like a vector space B to U. Right, okay. Just kind of along the side in case, you know, our viewers had, um, you know, are doing linear algebra instead. Um, let's take a little U and a little V. Definitely T of U, T of V. Okay. The same principle plots. Yeah, yeah, it's related to V if and only if, you know, they, they go to the same place. Mm -hmm. You know, we stick them into this machine or this function and then we spit out to the same location. Okay, so now I see, why do we like linear transformations? Well, one of the things about linear transformations, and this is gonna be very similar, of course, with group homomorphisms, is that, well, and, you know, we have a notion of additivity and scalar multiplication, but we really don't need the scalar multiplication here at the moment. Uh, well, actually we will in just a moment. Uh, but what we're gonna do, right, is that if we have T of U equals T of V, then using our scalar multiplication and our um, additivity, mm -hmm. we can write this as T of U minus T of V. Yes, okay. And this is zero. And well, fortunately, you know, this is additive, right? So we actually have that this is T of U minus V is zero. Uh, but, you know, this is the same thing as saying, uh, you know, that U minus V is in the null of T, or the null of space. Yes, I see. Uh, and actually in some books, you know, they call this the kernel of T, but um, it really depends. Uh, and this is, this is totally equivalent to, to our relation, right? Yep. This is, I see. Yeah, and, and actually, let's, let's do this, the, uh, the same thing with our group, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with a group. Uh, let, let's say the identity of H is like, you know, E or something like that. That sounds mm -hmm. pretty common. Um, but we have a group homomorphism, right? So what are we going to have? We're going to have phi of A times phi of B inverse equals E. Um, and actually, you know, <laughs> this can obviously be done formally. I'd rather not do it here, but um, you know, if we lump these two things together like we did with our linear transformations, we're going to get phi of a b inverse. That's right. Is equal to e sub h. Mm -hmm. And well, what does this mean? This means that a b inverse is inside of the kernel of our function phi. I see. It's practically the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you. <laughs> I'm not going to do it, you know, for the sake of time, but I guess we could do this for laying homomorphisms, you know, with, uh, or if we want to be really general and do like an R module homomorphism with something obnoxious, and then we could, as long as we have the right category and stuff like that. But anyway, <laughs> we don't need to go that fancy. Um, but there's something to this, right? We just saw that actually, you know, restricting this H or in the case of a linear transformation W, if we just replace those with our image, then we force our surjection. Right. So, on uh, the case of groups, for example, we would have we can say, okay, uh, I'm gonna go from G to the image of C. Mm -hmm. And with our linear transformation, of course, we can go from we can make T as a function from V over to its image, which of course it's inside of W. Yeah. And 
well, okay, we're subjective now. And as we just saw, uh, we have this um, equivalence relation. Um, now, do we still write it like say G modulo, uh, you know, like tilde or something like, or like V modulo tilde? With... Well, we just saw that we could mod out by the kernel instead of just the equivalence relation. Right, they mean the same thing. Right, right, they have the same meaning. So is there like a notation that is used here? Yes. And for that purpose, I'm gonna use the, I'm gonna call it V V hat, use G mod the kernel. Same thing with vector spaces. So G hat, G mod the kernel. I see. And of course, we'd have to you know, show that these are still morphisms, but at the very least, they're by judge. Mm -hmm. um, now, I mean, this, this is, isn't this our first isomorphism? Thing? You know, that's for, exactly it. For each of these categories? Yep, that's pretty much it. Great. <laughs> um, obviously, with the caveat that we'd have to show, of course, that, you know, it can be shown, I'd imagine that. But these two, uh, what would these be called? The quotients? Yeah, these are quotient groups. Uh, in, in, in the scenario for groups, this is a quotient group. And in vector spaces, this is also a vector space. This, this V modulo, the kernel? Yep. I see. And we'd have to show that those are indeed um, vector spaces or like a group in the other case, or mm -hmm. if we had a ring. Yeah, but it's easy to see that. So. Maybe not easy, but we, we, we could show it hypothetically, right? Right. But, but at the very least, this, this I, think, I think, highlights like what the first isomorphism theorem is really getting at, right? Right, that we can um, obtain it by ejection, right? Not only of sets, uh, I mean, in the case of groups, a group is a set with an operation, right? It's got some structure. Um, this guy. Let's say by ejection as sets, but also um, its algebraic properties are preserved. This is still a group homomorphism. And on the other hand, this T hat is still a linear transformation between vector spaces. I see. And the structure on each equivalence class is going to be like preserved, right? Like if we like, uh, you know. If we want to add vector, uh, like uh, equivalence classes or do the group operation on them, um, it's still preserved. That's right. Excellent. Excellent. And I'm sure the details can be found in any standard textbook. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, do we have a particular example? Let's look at a, a nice example. Okay. You know, in case I want to actually take a look at these things. So here we have an example using groups. Oh, the dihedral uh, group on. Uh, you know, the square. Yep. So R, I'd imagine, are, is going to be our rotations by 90 degrees. Yes, and S means our reflections. Excellent, excellent. So we have eight elements, and we're starting with the integers. Yes, so we're sending any integer to R to that number. I see, I see. So here we have a diagram, you know, um, so zero is sent to um, the identity on the dihedral dih group. I see the thing which fixes the square. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Being a group on homomorphism. Right, right. right. Uh, one is sent to R, but notice that also negative three is sent to R. Two is sent to R squared. Uh, notice though that negative two is also sent to R squared. Three is sent to R cubed. Negative one is sent to R cubed. And all the other values in Z are um, go towards uh, our dihedral group. I see. So something like say uh, thirty-eight. Uh, where 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 is thirty-eight going to go? Um, thirty-eight is going to go R two. R squared. R squared. Yes. I see. I see. Right, because th thirty-six is going to go to. Um, we we have a pattern here, right? It's like uh, yeah, it's kind of it like periodic that... in a sense. If we were to order this thing, right. I mean, we have only four rotations in the group, right? So we're, we're going, we, we travel in groups of four. I see. I see. And it looks like, you know, like, a, so if we follow our procedure for four, right, we want to first cut out those, those reflections. 
Uh, we certainly don't want them anymore. Right? I, I, I mean, you know, obviously you haven't drawn every element here, but I think it's pretty clear we're not hitting any of those reflections. Right, yeah. yeah. So what are we gonna do with that, right? Um, so I guess we want to restrict this down to, you know, oops, my bad. Uh, taking out these, right? So then what are we left with? I guess we're left with, um, with the powers of R, mm -hmm. which we can write like that. Or, you know, if we want to keep writing it as the image, image of F. Um, so anyway, it looks like multiples of four are going to go to E. Uh, you know, multiples of four plus one head off to R. Yeah, okay. And so yes. on and so forth. So we have this pattern here. Mm -hmm. um, but isn't that quite like reminiscent, right? You know, like if we were to lump all these things together, right? What's the kernel in this case? What are the things that go to E? Why those uh, multiples of four? Excellent. Yeah. So how would we write the, the kernel in this case? Yeah, so let's do that. So the kernel. Or is it? I see. And so with our notation, um, what is what does this mean exactly? Yeah, so this means all the elements that look like four K or four I see. So then this means though with our notation that like what is our induced F, right? This is gonna go from uh, well, our original set, but modulo this kernel, this new thing, right? Which was 4z. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go over to um, the image of F, which in this case, right? Which we can write like that. And and actually, yeah, this is nice and more now, right? So this would mean that we actually have z mod 4z is isomorphic to all the pitch back. Cool, yeah. Let's see. And that's our first isomorphic. That's it.